Well, the 27th Conference of the Parties, COP27, has recently ended in Egypt. I was participating in a daily Maverick webinar hosted by my friend Kevin Bloom last week, and he was joined by fellow journalists Alfredo Ho and Ethan van Damen for a debrief of the event. So to give a flavor of uh, what we're dealing with today, there is probably nobody better than Guardian columnist and environmental journalist George Mon Monbiot, who wrote a piece two weeks ago under the header, our leaders had a final chance to halt climate breakdown. They failed each and every one of us. And here, for the opposite of your listening pleasure, but in the interest of what appears to be the truth, are uh, two paragraphs from that piece. We know how way leads on to way, how the power amassed through corrupt decisions in previous generations drives the corrupt decisions of our time. We know that the license granted to fossil fuel companies by 50 years of failure has enabled them to make stupendous profits, $2.8 billion a day on average across that entire period, and that they need invest only a fraction of this money in politics to buy every politician and every political decision they need. We know that the easiest way for a politician to secure power is to appease those who already possess it, those whose power transcends elections, the oil barons, the media barons, the corporations and financial markets. We know that this power appoints the worst possible people at the worst possible time. We know how, as elderly, elderly billionaires seek to grab ever more of the life that slips from them, they create a death cult. I think Kevin might have wanted to term it an autopsy or post-mortem because the overall assessment wasn't encouraging. Well, you can watch this six-minute edit of the webinar at the above link. Well, the conversation called to mind my experience of the 17th COP, which was held in Durban in 2011. It was actually, for me, a very stimulating and motivating experience because I wasn't involved in the official delegations and arguments there. I was wandering around the fringes in the civil society spaces, and I found no shortage of interesting people who were eager to be interviewed. And one of the people who both challenged and inspired me was an Irish Catholic priest, a Columban missionary, Father Sean McDonough, who is one of the foremost eco-theologians in the Catholic Church, with now some seven books or more to his credit. Well, we made a good connection because he was particularly interested to learn about my work as a Catholic and as a social worker, who had taken Catholic social teaching seriously. It also turned out that he knew my mentor, Manfred Max Neff, and had taken much from his work as well. I told him how Manfred had inspired and galvanized me to get involved in the struggle of the Amadiba coastal residents on the Ponderland Wild Coast to support them in their effort to stop the mining of their ancestral lands, which also happens to be a biodiversity hotspot. Well, those of you who followed my channel and my work, you know that they have since done that and have now even gone on to also stop Shell's seismic exploration for gas and oil reserves along the whole wild coast. Well, I was really encouraged that this very learned theologian was so interested in the saga and how I had understood and worked out my own role. Well, he did most of the listening, but I did manage to get him to do some talking. Well, Kevin's webinar last weekend prompted me to dig out the video interview with Father Sean and offer this edit for the benefit of anyone who, like me, really wants to be obedient to Catholic social and environmental teaching, but are rather clinging with our fingertips to avoid falling into despair and fatalism about the future of the human species as we know it on our beloved planet Earth. Well, I started off by asking Father Sean to explain what relevance religious faith and ethics had for environmental scientists and activists, particularly given that the church has not always been seen to be particularly helpful. There is a direct relationship between 
between religious behavior, religious understanding, and, and then ethics and, and human outcomes. Now, traditionally, if we thought that the world is 6,000 years old and basically we're only, as we see in the early part of the Bible, we're loving our own and our enemies are over there, we hate them and we have no problem coming in uh, into Israel and uh, knocking down all the cities of the Hittites or whatever and knocking them all out. Gradually we begin to understand through the Hebrew scriptures you know, that the God that's behind of all this is a loving God and we come to the understanding that we have uh, in the person of Christ, forgiveness, the prodigal son, uh, the Good Samaritan. Unfortunately, until very recently, all of those were within a human context. But now we're basically seeing that humankind, with our technology, with this extraordinary knowledge, but what, with that knowledge went huge technology, starting with the coal technology in the 18th century, petrochemical in the 19th century, electric, nuclear, biological communication. Our technologies have given us great insight, but they've also wrecked a huge damage on the nature of the planet. We're here in Durban about one of them. Our parents had fairly decent lives, mainly because they used petrochemicals, coal first, oil and gas. They weren't aware of what they were doing was actually creating context that could be difficult for the future because they were increasing the amount of carbon in the air. The carbon in the air we know has been more or less stable since the end of the last ice age about 10,000 years ago, it's been 312-15 parts per million, sorry 200, now it's gone right up to uh, 380 or 85. This is having a huge impact on the planet itself and uh, a Vatican document came out there from the Pontifical Council uh, uh, Academy of the Sciences talking about the, the impact of climate change on the glaciers in the Anthropocene. Now that's a very interesting concept because what they're saying is, normally we would see humans, our moral behavior had an uh, impact on those who lived contemporaneously with us. We have good and bad, the like of Hitler, the damage he did, the 20 million people his war caused, uh, certainly it impoverished people for the next generation. But we didn't really have a great sense that we could impoverish people for every future generation. And that's part of what we're at here this week. Uh, I mean, the scientists tell us that there are tipping points. Yeah. Unless we begin to lower the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the, what we're em emitting, by 2016 to 20, then the possibility of keeping an average global temperature below 2 degrees Celsius is gone forever. So you're actually ushering in a new geological era, similar to the difference between the lower and upper carboniferous period, say 300 million years ago. Each one of those lasted about 25 million years but we're doing it in a hundred years. That's on the side of changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, for example, just alone. We're also changing the biology of the earth. One of the big issues of climate change is the impact on the natural world itself in terms of levels of extinction because, because warming earths, uh, many trees can't get up and move 100 miles north or 100 miles south. Maybe fishes can, but I've seen in my own country one of our sort of um, emblemic creatures was the salmon, uh, the salmon, the salmon of knowledge, a huge amount of Irish traditional lore around where I live. And now the salmon are beginning with real serious problems about the future. And one school of thought is saying it's, yeah, there are problems with, uh, with farm salmon and, uh, and with pathogens and all of that. But actually, the salmon feed on, on sand eels and because the Atlantic is warming, they're moving up 100, 150 miles north. So the salmon, when they go back to sea, actually aren't being fed on traditionally what... So here's an extraordinary example of, of a knock-on effect from global warming, atmospheric warming, ocean warming, and then the impact that it could be having on one species. So these issues now are becoming moral issues uh, because, as I say, we're now in a new context, we're in a new level of celebration. So in actual fact, the issue, we'd never thought of it before. We thought of suicide, homicide, yeah, maybe even genocide, but we're now actually, we're now, even, we're now in the possible of, of biocide. And so there's a whole uh, challenge to the religious community, to the religious leaders particularly, to spell out clearly these new contexts for religion, for understanding, for celebration, and for what kind of moral activity is commensurate with these new understandings. And I find even here, I was at Mass this morning, and I was delighted to hear the Cardinal talk about uh, about you know the future and the poor 
But I would love to see him and everyone now from here, the poor not just of the human species, the poor of every species. I mean, the poor, as Tom Berry's, one of his last books, uh, talked, the children of the fishes, the children of the chimpanzees. That's the world of the future. And even, you see, in, if you want to say um, self-survival, we are a creature, as, as, as life emerged, green, green plants, chlorophyll, developed an extraordinary ability to get the energy of the sun and transform it into food and in the process give off oxygen. It's a, probably the greatest technology that ever happened on the planet. All life depends on that now. We, have, we eat green matter, green matter, or we eat creatures uh, that eat green matter. So, in a sense, we have to have a, a great sense of our communion with, with all the rest. But, for example, you know, you take the Western diet, just as a moral issue. We know, for example, that uh, how much energy it takes to create a kilo of plant protein, as against a kilo of, of beef protein, for example. So, I think in the future, religious leaders will be saying to us, look, we've got to, we can probably support a population of maybe 7 billion, 8 billion on the planet if our human diet is mainly root crops, uh, cereals, uh, vegetables. We can't do it if, if, we, if everyone begins to follow the Western diet. So here now, there's a new moral imperative coming from the empirical data around us, rather than coming from, from the heavens. And that's what I think should be religious leaders need to need to be doing and meat is a good example of it like the bishops in in, in england and wales they're recently we're going to go back stop eating meat on friday because we want want to get back to an old catholic identity now that's crazy as far as i'm concerned and you see if you go back well will we start eating fish well of course we're destroying the, the oceans as well we're on course to actually have wiped out all wild fish within 60 years if we keep uh, fishing the way we have been over the last 40 or 50 years since World War II. So it's a new context. I think it's an extraordinarily exciting context uh, because a lot of the old tried answers, they no longer apply. But what does apply is these emerging principles that could give great meaning to people's lives. So instead of saying, oh, I'm just a little speck at the end of uh, 13 billion years and 400 billion stars, I, uh, I am actually that whole universe, I'm part, that's my story. I'm there from the very beginning. Multiple transformations. So, I, in a sense, I touch it all. Uh, be able to celebrate that, take on board what the moral, what the import of that is. And of course, you know, pray, yes, pray, yes, but pray. with this, this realistic context and have these great relationships. To go back to the Eucharist, a relationship with God, with the divine, our relationship with all that's gone before us, our relationship with all humankind, past and present and future, and our relationship with all creation. And if that's not a satisfying way to live, if that's not good news, well, I don't know what is. I have to ask you this question. Yeah. You talk of Genesis. The book of Exodus always intrigued me that when you look at the great plagues that befell you know, Pharaoh and the people, and they were actually symptoms of ecological disturbance. Yes, the yes, the yes. disturbance and the upset of the ecological sure, system. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's right there, uh, my second book, The Cleaning of the Church, and I, looking at some of the prophets, it's right there. If, if the context of human in engagement is destroyed, it also destroys the natural world itself, and it comes back to haunt you. And that's what we're seeing, for example, with, with nuclear power. Look at Fukushima. We thought, you know, it's almost, you know, it's the old Zeus thing. We think we're stealing fire from the gods. Yeah, you steal fire from the gods. Mm. But boy, there's a, a heavy price to be paid. And look, take nuclear power in the context of the kind of moral world I'm talking to you about. Okay, so we steal fire, we get away with it. But then we create something like plutonium. The half-life of plutonium is 11,000 years. You're talking about at least 10 times that. So you're talking about a, a substance that will be toxic and will be radioactive for 120,000 years, which is longer than the population of the world outside of Africa. And we think that, that's, that, you know, that, that is a rational thing to do. I mean, that is, must be the most extraordinarily crazy thing anyone ever thought of. Of course, I believe, and of course the original nuclear programs, both in Britain and the United States, were there for the military. And unfortunately, it's the military, in my estimation, are still promoting nuclear. I am delighted. I've written on nuclear power for the last 30 years. Uh, the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences used to be pushing it 
a little, a little try thing. Oh, you, a lot of people on the planet they need energy. Oh, nuclear power. So it's you know, you know, this is the way it works. Nuclear fusion. Well, you don't actually. We don't need it, but it gives you phenomenal power. I mean, this is the kind of. Now, after Fukushima, they're saying, "Hey, I think we better look again at this." And I actually, think, I'm just finishing a book actually on nuclear power after Fukushima. Really good. Uh, George Munby, I seem to be quite. So he said he was converted to nuclear yeah, power. I don't, but, he, but he doesn't. He, it, 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 unlike George, he didn't give any a, a answers. And my reasons are very simple. The first one is is geology. Okay, we say, uh, well, let's put one in the south of Ireland. You know, there, there's no plate there. You know. Uh, so there's no, we're not going to get a no tsunami. Okay, I said, that's very, very good. Uh, do you know what happened on November, f November the 1st, 1755? No. There was one of the biggest earthquakes in Europe in the last thousand years. Uh, the, whole, the city of Lisbon was completely wiped out. And the most interesting and ironic thing about it, and it did a lot actually to unsettle faith in Europe, was it happened during the morning when a lot of pious Catholics were at Mass and all the churches fell down on top of them and killed them. So the unpious Catholics or those who weren't pious at all, a lot of them were saved. And Voltaire, Voltaire wrote a, uh, I forget, the, uh, I remember the, the piece exactly saying that, like, look at this God, if, if this God was a really good God, I mean, he got, he got the wrong guys, he got the wrong people, the people who were church, they should have been saved. So <laughs> geologically, Africa is moving up the African plate is moving up into Europe. Within 15 million years, the Mediterranean would be gone. The Mediterranean mountains are the high. So the reality is, the Grand Canary, that huge cavern there, which is just across, that could blow tomorrow, next week, 100 years from now. We don't know. And that would send a tsunami up the Atlantic at about 20 meters high, which was higher than actually happened at Fukushima. You don't know that almost every place on the planet where you say, oh no, there's no problem. Now we're beginning to say, hey, yes, there could be a problem here. The second thing with nuclear power at the moment, and will continue, use enormous amounts of water. So naturally you put nuclear power stations close to the sea. Uh, three degree, four, four degree annual increase within a hundred years. And nuclear power plants are built for three to four hundred years. They operate for 60 years, 40, 50 years. They take at least the same amount to decommission uh, and, and, and they're still there. So the geology, architecture, natural resort, and now the money. We were told Chernobyl, they had no containment vessels. So once the experiment went wrong and the hydrogen ignited, it blew everything off. And then the graphite and, uh, and the particles, including plutonium, went all over Western Europe. What happened in Fukushima? We were told things that cannot happen, that actually three of the reactors actually did melt down. These are, what, a metre and a half of hardened steel. So the new designs, everyone who's talking about a new design is going to have to think, how do we increase this dramatically? And one of the little interesting things in supplies, when nuclear power was in its heyday in Britain and France and the uh, United States and Germany, Everyone knew who the steel manufacturers were and where things were coming from. Most of those industries are dead. The last nuclear power plant built in Britain was, size well be, it was built in 1986. All the senior engineers, senior planners, senior scientists, they're either dead or they're retired. Mm. A lot of the, the steel is coming from places in the world that you would, let's say, have a little wonderment mm. about when you go to see what how do you check the quality of all of these? There are so many issues with nuclear power. And the best, the biggest one is finance. First of all, from the beginning to, to the getting, getting power, you're talking about 16 years. So I'm asking you, could you give me 3 billion euro that I want to invest? And by the way, I'll be giving you some return maybe 17 years from now. Now, if you have any other scam that could go that way, I, I, I'd like to hear about it too. It's, it's a huge scam. Nobody is going to put private capital into it. It's going to have to be, and I think in this country here, it's not about it. It's not about it's not about uh, energy. It's about your military. It's not about energy in, in Britain. It's about the military. It's not about energy in Iraq or in or, or Iran. It's about the military or, or I mean Pakistan. Now we know it in Pakistan and we know it in Iraq or Iran, but are we any different? Like hell we are. So, but all of those, in a sense, this new 
Tom Berry calls a new story, new cosmology, a new context of living and understanding on the earth. That's the kind of framework that will give us, that will give us joy, identity, uh, a, a, a wonderful life, huge celebratory potential, wonderful relations with na nature and with our friends and our lovers and wives, and a moral compass to, to, to direct us uh, in the current context. And that's what religion is. I've committed my life to it as a missionary. I, I have never for a moment thought otherwise, and I still think it's good news. Well, very interesting that when Pope Francis released his papal encyclical, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home, four years after COP17, I wasn't totally surprised to discover that Father Sean had in fact authored the first draft and had been deeply involved into the whole process. Uh, he has in fact since written an extensive commentary and republished the encyclical as an invaluable resource to helping us get our head, hearts and spirits around the issues. Well, there's a link above to the book available on Amazon. Well, I was particularly encouraged to read these two clauses from the encyclical, which captured exactly the gist of the conversation Father Sean and I had had four years beforehand. I quote at clause 145, Many intensive forms of environmental exploitation and degradation not only exhaust the resources which provide local communities with their livelihood, but also undo the social structures which, for a long time, shaped cultural identity and their sense of the meaning of life and community. The disappearance of a culture can be just as serious, or even more serious, than the disappearance of a species of plant or animal. This imposition of a dominant lifestyle linked to a single form of production can be just as harmful as the altering of ecosystems. Well, that certainly describes the motivation that inspired me to get involved. In clause 146, he goes on, In this sense, it is essential to show special care for indigenous communities and their cultural traditions. They are not merely one minority among others, but should be the principal dialogue partners, especially when large projects affecting their land are proposed. For them, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identity and values. When they remain on their land, they themselves care for it best. Nevertheless, in various parts of the world, pressure is being put on them to abandon their homelands to make room for agricultural or mining projects, which are undertaken without regard for the degradation of nature and culture. Thank you, Father Sean McDonough. Thank you, Pope Francis. The Amadiba salute you for listening to their story. <laughs>